So my dough sat for about 10 minutes. It's softened up quite a bit so that I can knead the rest of it and hopefully get it into a little bit of a smoother texture. And that smoothness, so I flipped it over so that I had the seam on the palm of my hand and I just begin to do what I was doing before. So the smoother that my dough gets, that's what's telling me that my gluten is developing and it is going from a short texture to an improved texture to an intense texture. So you can see how much smoother my dough is getting just from that little bit of kneading. A lot of bread making is listening to the dough and when it needs to relax, giving it time to relax. Bread making is all about timing and your dough and your yeast is gonna tell you when it's ready. So much smoother. Now what I am gonna do is a gluten window test. So I'm gonna tear a small piece off of my big dough. And I'm going to very gently work this between the heel of my hand and my fingertips. Very gently wiggle it, rotate and wiggle. Rotate and wiggle. Ignore this pinky, it doesn't work. <laughs> rotate, wiggle, rotate, wiggle. You always wanna be nice to your dough. I always say you wanna treat it like a lady. So here we are stretching our dough and checking to see if the gluten is developed. If the gluten was not all the way developed, meaning your dough did not go through all three stages of gluten development, meaning short, improved, intense, and the three stages of mixing, then this dough would just break. But the elasticity or the gluten development is what is allowing us to stretch it out and it should be thin enough that it forms what we call a window pane or a translucent piece of dough and when you poke it it's strong enough that it doesn't break immediately. So I see this translucent window pane right along here. So it's see-through, it's thin, and when I poke it, it doesn't break. Nice and strong. So this, my friends, is the gluten pane test or the gluten window test. So my gluten is strong enough that it is ready for our next step in the 12 steps of bread baking. So we did scaling, we did mixing, and now what's next is bulk fermentation. So I'm going to get my window pane incorporated back into my dough. And I'm going to shape my dough into a little bit, kind of like a nicer, shape for it to do bulk fermentation. So the way I do that is I pull the dough towards me and I tighten up the seam that's underneath. I'm gonna try on my cutting board here without knocking over the camera. So I cup my dough and I pull, hoping to get that dough stuck underneath my fingers. Now this piece stays on the bottom, so I'm going to rotate it, keep that piece on the bottom, cup it again, and pull. Cut it again, pull. 
if your dough is just kind of sliding around and you don't have a lot of resistance, just put a little bit of water on your board so that you have just a little bit of tackiness and resistance. This is gonna give you tension in the dough. Give you a nice round shape so that your yeast can continue to feed during bulk fermentation or first fermentation. Okay, nice and round, nice and strong. And we're gonna let this rest probably about an hour. Um, depending on the ambient temperature of the room, sometimes it'll take 40 minutes, sometimes it will take an hour. Uh, usually you don't want to do first fermentation past an hour. So during first fermentation or bulk fermentation, my dough is going to double in size. So what's happening is you have all your little yeast molecules all throughout your dough. And the yeast is feeding on the sugars that are available to it directly surrounding it. So all the starches from the flour, the granulated sugar, the milk powder, if we had honey or malt syrup in this, your yeast is feeding on those sugars. And as it feeds, it creates carbon dioxide and alcohol. That's going to aerate the inside of our dough. So all of that gas is going to expand our gluten is going to be trapping all of that gas and our dough is going to double in size. Now what's important about bulk fermentation is that you make sure you cover your dough. So I have my piece of plastic wrap here and I wanna make sure that my dough is totally covered. You don't need to tuck it in or anything. You can just lay it right on top. And that makes sure that my dough doesn't develop what we call elephant skin or um, a dryness on top. Once you have that dryness um, and it goes into the oven like that, it's going to prevent your dough from rising in the oven. It's giving it kind of like a, a, like a skin, kind of like a pudding skin. So to prevent that, we just put a little bit of plastic over it. You can use a dish towel if you'd like. Uh, I happen to have plastic wrap, so I use plastic wrap. I'm going to set my timer for about 40 minutes and I'll show you how I know when bulk fermentation is done. I've given my dough an extra 10 minutes in bulk fermentation and we're ready to go. So I do a little love tap on top and you can see how the dough rises up after I poke it. And I don't leave much of a fingerprint Okay, so my dough has finished in bulk fermentation and I'm ready for my next step in the 12 steps of bread baking. So I'm going to remove the plastic wrap and immediately you can smell the fermentation. It smells sweet, smells milky, smells like yeast. So as I'm looking at my dough, I can see really, really nice gases in there. So since my dough has doubled in size with my alcohol and my carbon dioxide gas that's inside, before I move on, I need to do my next step, which is folding. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to sprinkle a little bit of flour on the top. Uh, we actually call it throwing flour in the bake shop. And I'm going to degas my dough. So basically I'm going to smack it down so that I get rid of all of the extra gases that I don't need. And then I'm going to fold the dough onto itself like I'm folding a blanket. And what that's doing is redistributing my food to my yeast. So earlier we discussed how there's yeast molecules all throughout the dough. Now, if this is your yeast molecule, one single one with millions of them, your yeast is only able to feed on the food that's directly surrounding it. So your food is coming in the form of flour, granulated sugar, milk, milk powder, honey, malt syrup, molasses, all of those things that are, all those ingredients that are in your dough are what your yeast is feeding on. And that's what's creating your fermentation. Now, your yeast molecule is here and it's only able to feed on everything that's surrounding it. 
once that yeast molecule eats all of that food, it still needs to keep feeding because if it doesn't, it dies. Now, there's a lot more food that's available all throughout the rest of the dough. The yeast just can't get to it. So your job as the baker is to redistribute all of that food that is throughout the dough back to the yeast molecule so that it can keep feeding. And as it keeps feeding, it creates more fermentation and in turn, more alcohol, more air pockets, more flavor. So two reasons why we fold after bulk fermentation is to expel all of our excess gases and to redistribute our food to our yeast. Folding also helps to strengthen the gluten in our dough. So I'm going to get my flour and I'm going to throw a little bit of flour on my, on my dough. So what we do is we grab a nice handful and we side arm it like this. And what that's gonna do is give us a, an even distribution throughout the dough or right on top. So if you look, you can see a nice even spread of our flour on our dough. And the reason I flour my dough is so that my hands don't stick when I degas it. Okay, so a little bit of flour and we're going to get rid of all that gas. See that little air bubble? This is also called punching down. Okay, so we degassed. We make sure we're not sticking to our bench and we're gonna fold. So we're gonna bring this dough to the middle. Okay, so the top came to the middle. The bottom is coming to the middle. And then my sides come over. Then I flip and I am ready to divide. 